you know what? There's so many ways to get to success, you know, and the more unconventional, probably the more successful you're going to be, honestly, because you've had these experiences of getting tough. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards, and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Andrew Dudham, founder of Hims, Erica Nardini, CEO of Barstool Sports, Daniel Dubois and Whitney Tingle, co-founders of Sakara Life, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Stoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden from Unstoppable. We're very, very excited to have Diana Cap here. Hello. Hello. So excited to be here. Yes. Very excited to have you here. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Diana Cap is uh, a friend of mine, but also the author of a great book that I was lucky enough to be a part of uh, a chapter in uh, called Girls Who Run the World, 31 CEOs Who Mean Business. And I wish you guys could see the book right now. It's it's the cutest illustrated book ever. And it's super, super great. And it launched came out on October 15th. Yeah, I'm three months in now. And you have been on this whirlwind tour of like meeting with all of these different groups, school groups. I mean, you can talk a little bit more about this, but I was just saying how I've just been incredibly impressed with everything that you've done to actually get the word out about the book. And if you guys haven't seen the book or haven't bought the book yet, uh, definitely buy it. There's, um, in addition to having a, a bit of a story about me in there, there's also the entrepreneurs behind Rent the Runway, Stitch Fix, Pop Sugar, Glossier, Minted, Soul Cycle, Bare Essentials, uh, lots of great entrepreneurs. And so, yes, definitely. Um, to have uh, have a look at that and read some of their stories. But I want to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, why you decided to launch the book as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it definitely is a book that comes from a personal place. Um, I just was, a, first of all, I was a young girl who didn't have a really strong belief in herself. And I remember, I mean, even going back to like third grade, I went to the career fair at my elementary school and there was like 50 uh, workshops you could choose from. And I attended cake decorating and hairdressing. And then, you know, it just, even though my mother worked, I lived in a traditional household where sort of my dad, who was kind of a prominent lawyer, all the accolades around work always went to him and my mom did all the accommodating. And I just have thought a lot about women and how they feel about themselves in terms of what tables they belong at and how ambitious they can be. And when I had a daughter who popped out of me basically with her hands on her hips um, you it know, was she, such a force. She wanted a whiteboard for her fifth birthday because she loves to do lists and she's just, I mean, she really is a powerful being. And I just kind of looked at her and I thought, you know, how is someone like this going to grow up in this world we have where we still have Forbes magazine publishing a list that says a hundred most innovative leaders in America and it's 99 men and one woman. So I wanted to change the conversation and help raise a generation of girls that expect to be the CEOs and the founders and people like you that are going after things they're passionate about. It's not um, comfortable or typical for a girl to see herself in that role. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, your daughter is just such a force, as I said. I mean, when you were interviewing me for the book, I remember us all sitting down. And I mean, she was asking me as many questions as you were about, you know, lots of different 
sort of issues that she had and questions she had around, you know, starting a company and how do you know to to focus on this and how do you build a company and where did you come from and all of all of these things. So I think it's really interesting too what you're saying because do you think that it can be taught or like you you talked about your daughter, you know, just popping out. I mean, what do you think it was that made her just be different, right? Was it you? Was it, you know, was it having, you know, males around her too that believe she could do it? I mean, I do think a lot is your nature and sort of how you pop out is definitely has a big way in factor. But for me, I had like a real life turning point that changed how I saw myself. And what that was, was when I was about 24, I was working in Washington. I was kind of doing the expected thing. I was working on the Hill. I was back home after college. And I just didn't feel at all like I was pursuing my own path. And I didn't feel independent. And I didn't feel good about myself. And so I made this decision. I'm going to move to the Bay Area completely by myself. I'm going to prove to myself that I can do it. And I came here. I, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a computer. I would like go to this coffee shop that was in somewhere near the Castro where I would print out my resumes to send out to different places. And I would, you know, walk back up the hill in my high heels because I lived way at the top of Twin Peaks. Anyway, surviving that experience was um, just changed how I felt about myself. I It's like the resilience word that you often talk about. It was like I completely proved to myself that I am so tough. I can move to a new town. I can get employed. I can make it on my own. And that really changed everything for me. And do you think like that experience just of, it, you know, d- does everybody... Like that just takes a ton of courage, right? And and I think and resilience and and like how how do people find that? I mean, do you think that just by reading other people's stories and hearing, I, I think that that's really what I've seen in your book too. That you know, I've I've been to a couple of the book signings as well, where you see these audiences of young kids, and and your focus has been, I think, not just on you know women like me who want to hear other stories about CEOs who have done it, but also on the tween and teen market. I mean, where do you think, I mean, how did you decide to really target that market? Well, I think these messages start really young and 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. And then that number doubles by the time they get to high school. So girls really have like, they come out with a fair amount of confidence And then culture like erodes it. And it is things like they turn on the TV and they they very rarely see women in the award shows, you know, winning the big awards or they um, go to conferences and they're never the, the key speakers. Even academic papers I've read have, you know, like 80 percent of the citations are from male lead investigators. So all these things have an effect. There, it's like subtle, 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 but it adds up to, I don't belong. It, this isn't, women don't do these things. They don't make the big inventions and discoveries. Like, who are the household names that girls know today? They know Jeff Bezos. They know Mark Zuckerberg. So like, true. there's women that are kicking ass and doing so many impressive things, disrupting every industry you can think of. And a whole bunch of them are in my book. And they're not, these are not the people that, that we know, you know, most of these people remain unknown. So I also think that the reason to focus on girls is they are reading books at that age that are about pioneering women, but they're reading about Amelia Earhart and Marie Curie and kind of these pioneering women of the past. And there are working women today that are doing just as daunting and, you know, risk taking and courageous acts. And they should know about that. It'll affect how they think about what's possible. I really believe that. It's it's interesting. I mean, you know the story, but my son came to me, my 17-year-old, when I think he was 12, and, and said, uh, Mom, 
I just realized that women aren't CEOs. And I was like, where's he going with that? Right? Like he's, you know, he's saying this to me at the dinner table. And he said, I, I was listening to Sheryl Sandberg talk about, you know, women aren't CEOs of companies, but you've always been a CEO. So why is it that, you know, there aren't more women CEOs? And, you know, I, I, I didn't have a good answer for him because I really believe that, you know, that's wrong, right? That more women should be CEOs. But, but how many women or how many girls out there are hearing that statistic and saying, oh, gosh, I'm never going to be able to do it, right? Yeah. And it's just, and so it's sort of counter to maybe, you know, what women are trying to achieve, too, by saying like, oh, there's only this many, because what is that message that's actually getting to, you know, this young teen audience, too? Instead, we need people like you and like girls who run the world to sort of say like, wait a minute, there might not be as many, but here's some examples and you should go do it too. There's a lot of like really important, I think, parenting ideas that come out of this book too, because girls are, they're good at school and they're good at following the rules. And there's this whole kind of perfectionist thing going on right now. That's about like how girls should be and they should be pleasers and that is like the opposite kind of personality trait that make for an interesting, compelling entrepreneur. You have to be willing to be contrarian. You have to be willing to have people tell you no over and over again and steep, you know, keep coming back. And I mean, you've lived this, but I think that is not the message that we're giving to girls for the message that girls are get is get the good grades, be the good girl, be a perfectionist. And like, you know, in this parenting culture now where you have to be good at everything. And, you know, I think so much of what we have to let girls be is just free up girls to kind of like be messy, be make mistakes, you know, try things. let them yeah. take risks and try things. And if they hate some activity they're doing, like quit it and try something new. You know, that's not where where we're at as a society. And I think it I mean, it's the same thing for boys, but I think it has a much bigger harmful effect on girls because they're sort of, they're more inclined to sort of be the pleaser and need to have that outside external acknowledgement that they're good or that they're, you know. Yeah. Did you see a consistent thread amongst these, uh, these entrepreneurs and CEOs? These women in this book have just like insane amounts of moxie. Like moxie has become my favorite word since I've had the book out. And I love telling the story about Jen Hyman of Rent the Runway and how when she scored this meeting with Diane von Furstenberg, right when she just had the idea to launch this rental business, she's driving to Manhattan and she's been told by Diane, you know, I'll see you for half an hour on Friday afternoon. She's driven down from Boston. And when she's 10, 10 minutes outside of Manhattan, her cell phone rings. She picks it up. It's Diane's assistant. And she says, hey, I'm so sorry, but this meeting isn't going to be able to go forward. And, you know, Diane's really sorry. And she's actually not even going to be able to reschedule. And Jen has at that moment, she has the wherewithal to just hold the phone there and say, what? What? I don't hear you. The, the cell phone's cutting out. I'll be there in 10 minutes. And it was that's some like deep inner, yeah. like, I believe in myself. And I'm you know what, I don't care what the rules are. I'm showing up anyway. I'm living my own life. And she did show up. And one question that she asked herself at that moment, it's such a good tip, is she asked herself, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? And when you're thinking about taking a risk or like doing something a little on the edge, if you ask yourself that and you like play out the possibilities, then it just isn't so bad. She was like, okay, I could get escorted out or I could never get in the door or I could make a fool of myself and I'll be really embarrassed, but none of that so bad. Yeah. Um, but the, the women in the book really do have that kind of a little bit of like, everyone's turning left and I'm willing to go right. And I mean, some of that came from having parents that just like let them follow weird passions. Like one of my favorite entrepreneurs in the book is Jessie Ganay. She has this packaging business down in LA called Lumi. And she's um, became obsessed with screen printing. And her parents like went with it. Like she was filled the whole basement with like weird printing implements and 
trying all these techniques. She even left high school after junior year and went out to LA to like sell t-shirts because she made this case to her parents in a PowerPoint that there was more stores per square mile in Los Angeles. So that's why you had to sell the t-shirts there and not in Detroit where she lived. I love that story, yeah. But now she's making boxes for Casper and Stitch Fix and she's killing it, you know, and she's, she just had the, this unconventional upbringing where she was like falling in love with printing. It's a weird passion, but you got to go with that. And her parents went with that or like Sarah Blakely of Spanx always tells the story of how her father would ask the dinner table, all the kids at the dinner table, like, what was your big failure today? And then whatever they said, he would high five them. And it's just, we need to normalize that. Like, it's cool to make mistakes and that's how you learn. That's how you move things forward. I remember when I was getting cold feet about moving to New York. I grew up in Arizona and I remember the day before I was leaving, I said to my dad, I I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Like I had gotten a job at time and I was, you know, all set up to go out there and I had a couple thousand dollars. Like I figured I'd get a paycheck and then I'd be able to pay my rent, you know, and stay with a friend before before I ended up getting an apartment. And I remember just freaking out, just thinking like, I don't know if I can actually do this. And my dad said to me, like, well, what's the worst that's going to, that could happen? Like if you went out there and I talk about this a lot, like it's some of the best advice. I mean, you talked about like parenting advice and in the book too. And I think, you know, I, I end up saying that to my kids all the time, like, and they're like, yeah, that's true. Like, what is the worst that could ultimately happen. And so for me, my dad was like, every time you get into a situation where you're trying to figure out like, should you or shouldn't you like, sometimes it actually boils down to, you know, should you be making if you end up making a decision to do something like how much money could you ultimately lose? And so even f- like in managing the team, all the, the hint team, I'll say, you know, like, go ahead and try it if it's not going to be that much money. And, Mm -hmm. and, And if you can evaluate, for me, moving to New York was like, okay, I mean, I remember my dad saying to me, okay, figure out how much, you know, your lease is going to be, you're not going to have any furniture anyway. So that's not that even if you had to like walk away and like leave the furniture, I mean you know, you're buying stuff from Ikea or whatever, and it's not going to be that low expensive. Cost, right. yeah. low. And then a one-way ticket. I remember him saying, like, figure out what a one-way ticket is from New York back to Phoenix. And when I figured it out, it was, you know, it was a lot of money to me. It was probably like $10,000 was, and he was like, but that's like in a really important life lesson that you're going to learn on, on risk and like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, so anyway, I, I think that there's so many things like that that, you know, talking about from a parenting standpoint, but also just more people need to be told to just go and take those risks because I think you're right. Like we don't do that in school. Like it's very, I would say like art classes used to tell people, I remember um, in my art classes, they'd say, go take risks. But other than that, like people didn't, you know. That's that's like the only class I had where people were saying, go take risks. I mean, think about the New York story. because It reminds me a yeah. lot of my moving here to California. Your dad had to withstand that idea that like you might be like you might be uncomfortable. You might be insecure. You might be sad and lonely and like and but he let you go and almost pushed you to go. And that experience probably completely shaped you to yeah. think like, I can do many things I never knew I could do. No, totally. And it's a lot of the women in the book talked about like, it's not about, you know, who does it best or who wins first. It's like being the last man standing. Yeah, like totally. you just have to like take the punches and the punches and the punches and then just keep moving forward one tiny step at a time. Like, I can't think of a woman in the book who got the funding the first time around, who doesn't have a story where they got like the 30 no's. And, you know, Katrina Lake at Stitch Fix has this story where her Harvard professor told her like that idea is an inventory nightmare, you know, and she just had the wherewithal to say, you know what, I really believe in it. And I'm, we're going to change the way people buy clothes. 
but you're going to hear a lot of hard knocks and you have to be able to withstand that. And that only comes from having a hard experience, like moving to New York City all by yourself. And trusting your gut too. And yeah. I think like the only way that you can ultimately trust your gut is to experience failure and know that you can come back. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think about all of those, you know, stories in your book. I mean, it's really, you know, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't know, but I think like that for me is such a consistent thread where they had some hard knocks. I mean, Leslie Blodgett, like I know before she ended up, you know, really taking over the reins at Bare Essentials. I mean, she, you know, she had some hard knocks there too, right? Yeah. So I think it's just, it's, you know, figuring out like what else can we do and how to diversify so that you don't run into the, to a problem that's really going to have a massive effect if it is a failure. I think all of those stories along the way are super, super important. I mean, Leslie is such a great example to girls to know that like she didn't come up on some pristine path where she went to a prestigious university or even necessarily did well in school at all. She like transferred a couple times. She studied modern dance. She, so I think that this idea that there's like, you have to do the right thing and that there's only one way to succeed is a really good message that girls have to know and parents that, you know what, that there's so many ways to get to success, you so know, many. and the more unconventional, probably the more successful you're going to be, honestly, because you've had these experiences of getting tough. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also figuring out like what's good for you. Like I know Sarah Blakely's story, for example, I mean, she went to a lot of people to go and get funded. And, and you know, I heard her speak at a conference talking about this and I kind of chuckled like she said what she figured out after she heard so many no's was that she was actually talking to a whole group of men about wearing pantyhose. Right. Men don't wear pantyhose. So why was she going to them to ultimately fund her business idea? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's sort of this, a very similar story with Hint when I was going and talking to people about my Diet Coke addiction. I mean, the majority of people who have had, you know, an addiction or a strong liking to Diet Coke have been women. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the target. And so I'm talking to guys about a Diet Coke addiction. And unless they've actually lived with that, right, and, you know, maybe their wife or it, what yeah. or their mom or whatever, they they really don't see it. And so I think that for me, just hearing, you know, Sarah's story, like it really helped me to think like, I, I'm not alone, right? Like this is also but but also, if I were to go and, you know, advise other entrepreneurs who were trying to raise money, I'd think about like, are they your audience? Because I think that's really, really important and going out and raising money. It's like, you know, if you're going out, because they happen to be the big VCs in Silicon Valley, and, you know, you're going and getting a bunch of no's from those people, like, maybe that's just not your audience. And maybe like, why would they fund your business if they don't ultimately get what you're doing? I mean, mm -hmm. That's, that's, you know, I, I, and I think once in a while the checks come in just cause you've done a business before and they want to be involved or you happen to be married to somebody that they actually want to fund. And, you know, that's the way that stuff works. And I, I mean, it's crazy, but it's true. And it's a good argument for why we really need more women to totally. go work in venture capital because you do need to relate to the idea. You do. Yeah. And there's so few women working in venture capital. It's awesome that these places like All Rays are really trying to yeah. like set goals and really change the percentages. No, I think it's it's huge. But I mean, to date, it hasn't been that way. And, yeah. And I think, you know, more and more it needs to, yeah, really, it totally helps the, the argument for sure. So one thing that you talk about in your book is the rub off effect. I mean, we've talked a tiny bit about this, but can you explain a little bit more? About that? Like this sort of exposure effect. And like one of the studies that I read about that really strikes me is this study about patent holders. And so in they matched patent applications with zip codes. And they figured out that girls that grow up 
in zip codes that have a large number of female patent holders are something like 76% more likely to become a female patent filer themselves. And so we, we are affected. Like you can't be what you can't see is this like line everyone uses. And it's true. You know, you get really affected by what's around you and what kinds of things people are doing. And, and it, it sets the tone for what you decide to, to set your sights on. I really believe that. And that is a rub off effect. That's, that's awesome. One thing I, I think is with my book, we talk a lot about that this is just something that girls need to be seeing. But actually, like, I think guys need to be seeing that females are kicking ass and becoming entrepreneurs and doing some of the most impressive businesses of our day. I think there's way too many males there. They need to be part of the solution by seeing that it's just as possible for a woman to hold this job, you know, when they're thinking about who to hire. And, you know, so I think we need to teach our boys too. like, if we had a book full of male, interesting male inventors, we would never think twice that a girl that that book wouldn't be for a girl. But there's this funny double standard where people kind of look at my book and they're like, oh, you wouldn't ever want to give that to a boy. Why shouldn't they read about yeah. what is Sarah this the, Blakely is this has your done? Next book? It might be. I mean, I had the <laughs> cutest boy in Washington, D.C. I was speaking at, at Whitman High School and he was, I said, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but we know what did you think about this kind of feminist book? And he's like, well, I have to tell you, Mrs. Cap, I'm a feminist. And it was just so, it was so cute. He was like in ninth grade, like hadn't gone through puberty. But, you know, he, I think that the messages of Me Too and all of this, they are getting through. And I think that the that guys today, they want to figure out how to be kind of helping the situation and helping elevate women and not have a society that's got so many like strange gender dynamics that are, you know, difficult for women. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think about the son I'm raising. I don't know what you think, but he's so woke to this issue and he wants to do the right thing and help not hinder. Well, and he's had a strong mom. I think like that's the challenge. I mean, to, mm -hmm. you know, my earlier point, it's like they hear this messaging out there mm -hmm. and they're confused by it. Right. And they may not articulate that they're confused by it, but they are confused by it because they they feel like, you know, why is it that there's such a small percentage? Why aren't there more women VCs like, you know, and and while they, you know, have strong role models, female role models around them, whether it's, you know, a strong sister or a strong mom, I think like it's still, you know, something that they would love to be a part of it. But I think that the messaging, I don't know, like I, I, I think about this actually a lot that I think that the messaging does need to change in some way to sort of activate people to go and do something about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being a feminist as a, as a male is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, my son questions, he plays a ton of tennis and he questions all the time, like, why are we still having male teams versus female teams mm -hmm. for tennis? Like, why, why don't we, you know, there's female tennis players that he'd much rather play tennis with than certain guys. I mean, he's right. a senior in high school, right? right? And like, it's still separated and he just doesn't you know, understand it. I mean, the argument used to be that, you know, you couldn't have tennis players like women weren't as strong. And but we've proven that to be incorrect, right? Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we're actually looking at genders and making sure, you know, that they're still separated and, and in schools. I mean, it's, you know, we're not even talking about professional teams. Like, why is that the case? And he's questioning that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I think that it will change. And I don't think that we're going to still be talking about, you know, male soccer teams versus female soccer teams forever. Right? I'm so optimistic. Like, yeah. I feel like I, you know, going around and talking to these big groups of young women today, and looking at what's going on, everyone's looking to Greta Thunberg, who's, you know, leading the charge on climate change. Or before that, it was Emma Gonzalez. And she was, you know, on every television talking about gun control. And, 
the number of women running for office, the fact that our right now, like both stock exchanges are run by women, like things are, they are changing and all the new tools that make things so much more accessible. Like you can learn almost anything online, make it easier for women. They lower the barriers to entry. And I do think there's never been a better time to be female and that things are going to change. There's so much momentum. Definitely. No, I think it's, it's true. It's, it's exciting, but I think it needs to, but I think activating the, the male audience though is totally imperative. Yeah. It's so one, one Jesse Ganay said like every room you go into as a female in business, like find a male mentor, find a male advocate. Don't just say, I'm just going to, you know, have women as my sisterhood. And because that, automatically takes away so much power. And that's another really good piece of advice. Like, you know what, get the males on your side and, and, you you know, use the males, work with the males and have them be part of the whole situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's absolutely critical. So tell me a little bit about 2020 for you. So possibly another book in there that you're working on. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know yet whether I want to do a follow on um, volume two, there certainly are so many women I would still like to write about. Sometimes I think about, should I do, you know, girls who save the world or, you know, something that's a little bit more with a social mission. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I'm right now, I'm honestly, I'm so focused on getting the book out there. And there still are a lot of opportunities for me to go, whether it's entrepreneurship education you know, getting in front of Girl Scouts or the National Coalition of Girls Schools. Um, There's just, there's a lot of appetite right now for this book and girls. So, you know, that's what I'm doing. I don't know. I feel like a little bit like I'm a mouse on a wheel and I'm just going, going, and I don't know exactly where. But it seems like like everything that you're doing is just like it's getting traction along the way. And and people are talking about it, which is like, which is really, really great. One thing that's been so cool for me is just the number of interesting women I've met over the past year. And like every city I go to, I don't have to moderate a panel with women that are in the book. I can moderate a panel with any woman that's a leader or a CEO in that area. So I've, you know, going around, I've really met some interesting people and that's been, what's been the most surprising thing that you've heard at some of these talks? Like, have you, Hmm. you know, has there been backlash against, you know, one story that I, that I heard recently that I absolutely love is I met the salt and straw founder, Kim Malik up in Portland. Do you know what Salt and Straw is? And it's an ice cream oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. brand. Yeah. And I think they now are up to like 20 stores, but she opened in Disneyland and she has, it is now the most successful ice cream store, not just in America, in the world. Wow. And when she went into, it's like a little village that's down in Disneyland. And when she took her managers down there to open up this new store, they're from Portland. So they're like tattooed and um, pierced from head to toe. Right. And the Disney people were like, no, no, no. And she was like, yes, yes, yes. And so she really, and, and they ended up like they did let them work there. And now like a couple of the other brands that are in this little like faux village, they're also, their employees are also, you know, wearing what they want and have being themselves Changing cultures. And, yeah. yeah. And I just love that about her that yeah. she kind of had that. She was just like, you know what, take it as it is, or I don't need to be here. Yeah. You know, this is who we are and these are my best people. And you know, that's, that's awesome. who they are. So that's I incredible. love that story. Yeah. No, I that's, think that's a really cool that's story. That's amazing. And obviously an unstoppable one. We should interview some of these people. And what makes you unstoppable? I think I'm just really scrappy. Like I'm just really willing to like, I'll do the drudge work. I'm very like a one woman show. And that is like from 20 years as a freelance writer where you just have to like pitch and sell yourself and get so many no's and, you know, just kind of being willing to like do whatever it takes. And I think that's what, that's when I felt like, wow, I'm kind of an entrepreneur. Like 
that's a little bit what this has felt like because it's really is like you do everything. You do all the marketing, the social media, you write the book, you, I plan events. I, you know, it's like everything. You just jumped you know? in and done, yeah. done everything. I'll be, I'll be going into event planning next. Yes. That'll be my next chapter. I love it. It's so great. Mm. So, well, this is terrific. And again, if you guys have not uh, gotten a hold of this book yet, definitely order it on Amazon. Is that order the best? On Amazon okay. or even better is to go into your indie bookstore because we all need to support the bookstores Absolutely. and small businesses and keep them in business. If they don't have it, tell them to order it. It's it's great all around. Girls who run the world, Diana Cap. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kara. Fun to talk to you. Yeah. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to spotlight? please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.